have a little bit uh, after the airplane and the dry air. And so I should be okay. Anyway, um, I have a friend with me today. If you don't understand the story about the moose, just uh, if you Google Tim Berners Lee and moose, or Peter Norvig moves, you'll, you'll, you'll understand why. Not just ask me later. But anyway, so I've decided from now on all my talks to moose. Um, so, in talking about what I want to talk about today, I have used this title, Social Machines, the Coming Collision of Artificial Intelligence, Social Networking, and Humanity, which is a very complicated sounding title. And, I use it purely by coincidence as the same title as a book I have coming out this September. So I promised my publisher I would mention my book at every talk, so I have now mentioned the book. Anyway, but what we really want to talk about today, this, this idea of social machines, is something that has become one of the unifying themes within web science. It's something where we look at what's different about how things are done on the web and how we can use the web in new and different ways. And I'm going to talk about it today from several different perspectives. But there's really some confusion over what is meant by social machines. So one definition, this is a definition which, for example, the MIT Media Lab Social Machines Project uses, is it's a cooler sounding way of saying social network analysis, social media analysis so that uh, you're more likely to get into the newspaper. So they're not really looking at anything different than social media is out there, people are using it a lot, what's going on? So they say the main goal for social machines would be to create new platforms for individuals and institutions to identify, discuss, and act on pressing societal problems. But it doesn't really sound very purposive, it's most, mostly We'll interact a lot and that'll be good, okay? The second definition is one which, in actually the book, I do talk more about, but it's not what I'm gonna primarily talk about today. But that's, um, nowadays, the machine doesn't live on our laptop and our desktop. It tends to live on a phone or a next generation device. Um, it can be something on, I mean, you know, nowadays it's on your wrist as well as in your pocket one of these, uh, and all of these are becoming more and more things that are starting to be part of our social experience. So we've gone from a world where sort of the notion of a computer that you talk to and interact with was science fiction and often bad science fiction. So the computer HAL in the movie 2001 uh, was sort of this, uh, a computer that kind of went crazy, tells the whole crew, things like that. It's a wonderful movie. Uh, all of us who saw it when we were little became AI scientists, or many of us, because we really we didn't care about the spaceship and the space and stuff, but that computer was so cool, even if it went, had a few problems. <laughs> there were just personality problems, and everyone we knew had those also. But the, but the computer really, the notion that it could do all these things seemed very exciting to us. It was the first real presence of an artificially intelligent computer. Now we've moved to a world of Siri, and we're moving to a world where that computer is more and more with you all the time and learning about it, being personalized. So suddenly, we're not talking about each individual alone being a member of society, but each individual also having with them something that connects them to many other people. And currently, that's often done just through, through the simple sites like Twitter and Facebook and stuff, but it's becoming somewhat different, and that's what I want to talk about is where we might go with it. The third definition, which is the one we'll really talk about today, and which really is the one that is most relevant to what's going on in web science today, is this definition. We're talking about networks of people, I'm sorry, networks of machines that are supporting networks of people working together in ways that impact the real world. Now, there's actually an ambiguity in here that's on purpose, right? So what you might see is it says, working together, and do I mean it's the people who are working together or the two networks that are working together? And the answer is, we really want to make it the, the latter, the networks. So in other words, how do what's happening among the machines and what's happening among the humans 
rise together to let us solve problems that neither one could solve alone. So that's where we're going, and the definition I'm going to use. And it, it actually was first used in this context <clears throat> by uh, Tim Berners-Lee in his book, Weaving the Web. Now, uh, so Tim said, real life is and must be full of all kinds of social constraint, the very processes from which society arises. That is, we don't just randomly wander around the world and bump into people. Uh, we organize stores and summer schools and things like that for our interaction. So we live in a very structured world that we have created through the rules of society. So computers can help if we use them to create, and he used the phrase, abstract social machines on the web. Processes in which the people do the creative work and the machine does the administration. He goes on a little later to say, the stage is set for an evolutionary growth of new social engines. Now, what's interesting when you read this is to realize that this book was written in, uh, came out in 1999, was written around 1998. So this comes out before Facebook, before Twitter. There were social networking sites which had dozens and some of them even hundreds of people using them. But very few large, complex sites. So the, the very early ones were still just getting off the ground. So um, something called The World and The Globe, those are two different sites you probably never heard of. MySpace was just starting. Uh, Facebook was just, um, just getting out, was still limited to a very few number of colleges, things like that. So the notion of uh, what eventually became called Web 2.0 and social interaction on the web, many people sharing things on a read right web, was not yet a common concept. So Tim really saw that as a key piece of what he saw the web for uh, all along. In fact, he went on later to talk about some of the power of this and has visions that we haven't even encountered yet. I'll, I'll refer to a little bit of that later. Um, so, so the observation, the best way to get here today, I think, is through social networking. So now we live in a world that's very different, right? Most of you will have trouble getting through this talk without at least checking your machine once to make sure that, uh, you know, no one you know has said anything exciting on Facebook uh, about something in the world or uh, tweeted about what they had for breakfast or sent you some email. Uh, by the time I finish this talk, 30 emails will have come from uh, my university telling me to do things. Actually, they won't because it's early in the morning there, but this afternoon they will. Um, and so, so we have this world where people are using these machines extensively. And here's one that I really think shows this. This is my favorite example recently. So in uh, 2014, uh, it was reported that the video Gangnam Style, which I suspect, how many of you have seen it? Yeah, look around. It's that right. Everyone. I, I think there may have been one or two hands that didn't go up. I didn't, I didn't ask you who didn't see it because people consider that embarrassing, which is strange. Um, Two billion clicks, two billion times people watch that. Now, The Economist had this really nice uh, thing in it. So, the amount of time, is so you take the two minute video times two billion downloads, and it comes to 140 million person hours, right? So that's like you're having 140 people working for you, 140 million people working for you for an hour. And you, can, you have for many famous, um, things out there, how long they took. So the Empire State Building, which at the time it was created was the tallest building in the world, took, um, you, you could have built 20 of them in 140 man hours. Many, sorry, man hours, 140 million men. Uh, I've done, the, I've, I've turned that number into a lot of other things. It turns out uh, the IBM company hires about 400,000 people around the world if they work 24 hours a day, every day of the year, I think this comes to some large, several um, IBMs, I used to have the exact one, I think it's something like 75 IBMs, I don't have the number in front of me. Uh, you could build the Great Pyramid four and a half, four and a quarter times. I mean, these are staggering amounts of time spent on something that 
really, you can argue about what its social value is, right? And there were people who will argue that it has no social value, and people who will argue it actually has a high social value in terms of showing a particular lifestyle to many people around the world. Um, an interesting one is you can only build one and a half Wikipedias. So if you think about it, Wikipedia itself is something where people online have created something. I'm going to come back to that later. And when we look at Wikipedia, we see that it itself has consumed huge amounts of human effort. So, so starting around, um, I guess, about 2007, 2008 was when we first started talking about social machines in this new idea. Um, there was a, a paper that eventually got published in a different form, but the early form was actually a grant proposal, and the PIs included uh, Tim Berners-Lee, John Kleinberg, who many of you know is like a top theoretical computer scientist, Louis Van Aan, whom I'm going to talk about more in a few minutes, uh, Joe Feigenbaum, great computer theorist, myself and others, and it didn't actually get funded. Eventually, we sent it to England, changed the title slightly, wrote it up to date, and it, it became a project, which I assume you, uh, uh, Ellen and we'll talk about today, called Sociam, Social Machines. But, so it did get funded eventually, not quite in the same form originally, but what we had in the proposal was something that said, imagine if you could have hundreds of millions of people effectively able to network together, who could work with the data that's available to um, scientists and governments and non-governmental organizations, etc. you could put that, so if you could harness that creativity, so if you could use it for social good, you could use it to do things like cure disease, feed the hungry, empower the uh, powerless, etc. The, the best moment in this whole, in this whole grant process was we were, um, we had a phone call among the people who eventually become the principal investigators. So I'm, I'm talking to three people who have won the MacArthur Genius Awards in the States, the highest sort of, you are amazing award, and I wasn't one. And um, John Kleinberg is saying, you know, we're really trying to start to see the beginning of crowdsourcing. What if we took a mathematical approach? Uh, you know, we look at if you had a dollar, how would you best spend it on uh, Amazon Turk or something like that? And we even said, no, no, we should talk about sort of creating things that could, you know, capture people's times, doing little things. And, Tim sort of said, uh, what if we were looking at things like how we would use the web to cure cancer? And it was just this pause on the rest of the, the phone where all, the, all of us were sort of saying, oh my god, he's right. Why are we looking at these little things? That if you're really going to look at something you could do with this many people at that kind of scale, right? go after the big things. Uh, Tim's amazing. Right? <laughs> uh, you know, it's not everybody who can, who can render these other guys speechless for a while while they think of that. So, so there are a lot of different ways people have tried to harness this. So I won't talk about this much, but one is always that, that keeps occurring over and over again is, you know, can we do this essentially by accident? Can we take what people are doing on the web anyway and use that somehow for social good? The most famous of these was Google Flu. Uh, Google Flu essentially used a set of search terms that corresponded to various uh, things people were asking about and was able to show that they could predict flu outbreaks um, at an accuracy similar to what the World Health Organization, the CDC, Center for Disease Control, did, but earlier. So they were within a couple of days finding things that the CDC was reporting a couple of weeks later. Now, what's interesting is, is there's a lot of history to this, so there's actually articles out there about why Google Flu doesn't work, and there are many people who are very critical of this. Uh, it turns out that Google had to do a lot of testing to find those predictive set of terms. It wasn't just, let's make up 10 good, like, 10 good words that sound like flu and, and see if that works. They really did a lot of correlation and stuff. They found too many words that would predict too early, uh, you know, Wrong. So people were asking all the time about those things. Too few words, and it was just, uh, you know, not precise enough. But the other thing was, so they had this online, and over time it got worse and worse. 
right? So it somehow wasn't tracking humans and our, our, the way things change over time. And Google has argued it could be kept up to date. They did, didn't, and others have argued you can't. So it's actually been a, a fascinating story. But it shows that even something as simple as just using search terms and capturing them, and there have been many other papers. Um, Microsoft just had one out recently. Um, I don't remember what they were predicting, but um, I, I, it was something to do with, I, I believe it was hospital emergency room visits. They were saying you could actually see on people's web behavior indicators of things going wrong and things like that. But the problem with this, again, is it's not purposeful. You're sort of exploring much of the data and sort of saying, what can I solve from that? Not, I have a problem I'd like to solve, how can I use this? The real changer of things, I was going to say game changer, but it would be a terrible pun, is um, the work of Louis Van An. So Van An figured out that there were ways that you could harness what people were doing and sort of tune it, make it so that you could use that work. And now, this is enough years later that many of you um, have probably used some of these things I'll talk about. It. Now, Van An at the time was actually pretty well known. He was the guy who came up with the idea of the captcha. The idea that when you wanted to prove you were human, right, because people were trying to use machines to get information, and, and you might want to say, you know, I want to know is the thing. So he wanted to test, and he said, you know, people are really good at recognizing patterns and things like that that computers are bad at. So if you take some letters and say, what are these letters? Um, humans do better than computers. And if you distort them, and if you distort them in interesting ways, then it would be really hard for people, to, for, for computers, to, um, to learn those. And so that's what he tried, and it was very successful. Uh, it has the whole story behind it on its own. Um, in fact, one of the ways that the first set of captures, the first, you, you very rarely only see a single thing anymore on any kind of meaningful page. The reason is what happened is somebody came up with the idea of how to break the captures, which is whenever it, the system would encounter one, it would take it and they would send it to someone in China. So they had this, these whole rooms full of people like this who would spend all day long just saying what characters were in which chapters and getting paid a small amount, a very small amount of money for each one. But over time, with, with thousands of people and, and lots of um, examples, and then so what would happen is the computer would kind of reason about, say, this thing looks most similar to these, and this is what the human said, and so it started getting it right often enough that they had to make them far more complicated. If you look at them today, you'll see many different patterns, many different things, but most of them are either multi-word, combined letters and numbers, a lot of them are starting to have images or other things involved. Uh, and that's in part why. So, let me go to actually something else for a second. So, so the CAPTCHA notion, so he looked at people using the CAPTCHAs, and he came up with something called recaptcha. So the question was, people all over the world were using this, and they were, you know, again, they were doing it for something, and everybody was just putting tiny amounts of time in, but he realized the total amount of time was huge. Could you use that for something purposive? And so he came up with the idea that if you looked at what optical character recognition systems do, they're trying to read uh, things. And many of the things people were trying to do with them with scanners and things included trying to read old documents, complicated documents, things that were handwritten. So, so the character reader would come across a word and say, you know, I don't know if this word is this or this. In other words, I'm not quite sure what this word is. So, so the characters would be getting some kind of probability and would hit some and say, these seem kind of weak. So um, this one, the Norwich Line steamboat train from New London to Boston this morning ran off the track several miles north of New London. And that would be in some sort of old font that, um, you know, um, I don't have my machine with me. I had to transfer stuff, I forgot to transfer the picture. But I was going to show you a page from the New York Times in 1923, right, which actually has a story like this. And you can see it, it's hard to read, right? But you can do it. So, so what happens in, in, a, in the three captures is that 
uh, one of the words is the word it knows, and the other word is the word for which it has possibilities. In this case, that would be the word warning. And so what happens now is the you are given these two words, and you've probably seen these often. And there's a little thing in the corner that lets you say, give me more information that out of the 600,000 people who had used it at the time that, that we did the analysis, by now it's, it's in the, uh, I'm sorry, 600 million people. Now it's in the billions of times it's been used, not necessarily unique individuals. But almost no one ever has clicked on that to read the information. But if you did, what you'd see is you are agreeing that you are helping to improve optical character recognition. In fact, um, uh, Vanan sold this technology to, uh, to Google uh, at some undisclosed, but we assume fairly high price. Um, and it was actually the second thing it sold to Google. I'll go back to the first one in a second. But, um, so, but notice what's happening here. He's using the fact that you're doing something that you get value from to generate some value for someone else. So his idea was that there's a trade here. You want to get access to this website, so you're going to identify these two words, and they want to improve optical character recognition, so they will use it. And then he made the code available to everybody who wanted to do this. So we had websites all around the world who are helping to improve that character recognition. So earlier, um, as, as captures were morphing to recaptures, the thing that Lewis really got uh, well known for was games with a purpose. And you've heard the term gamification, making things games. You've seen it all over the web. You're, you're doing something which might be a game, but might not be a game, and you're getting points. And like, why am I getting points? And the answer is because people are sort of inherently uh, competitive. And you know, if I tell you, um, you know. Twitter, Twitter started taking off much better once it let you know how many followers you have, right? Things like that, because people started using it to gain more. Um, but, the, but the idea he came up with was what, what we do is we get people to play a game with each other, and we take the information that's generated from that game to use for things. And so the most famous one of these was called the ESP game. Uh, it's still floating around out there, although it's not really round. But the idea would be, you would get on the system and it would show you a picture like that. And then you'd have some amount of time where you and another person had to type words that you thought described the picture, and, it would, and when the two of you got the same word, then you got points. And the faster you did it, the more points you got. But also, it would give you these taboo words that you can't use the following words. And in fact, what's really going on here is it shows the picture, people type words. The most common of those very quickly get put onto the taboo, which forces people to have more words later when it's played again. And with enough pictures back there, you never notice you're seeing the same pictures. Plus, you're showing the same set of pictures to many, many different couples, so you're getting a lot of different agreements. So in this case, man and beard came up very early, so now you're guessing hat, and you might guess suspenders or, or something else. And, um, you know, Louis has a wonderful talk where he talks about all these technologies and all the mistakes they make and all the things that go wrong. Because, of course, a bunch of people might think they know who this is. That is just a random person. But he's had a great example where it's a picture of the actor Walter Matthau. And very rapidly, it converged throughout the community that that was a picture of uh, Saddam Hussein. <laughs> right, because when Saddam was the same was captured, there was this famous picture of him where he looks a lot like Walter Matthau, uh, and he was more he was better known than Matthau by people in other parts of the world. But again, so so this would go on, and there are many games that are still played this way. Some which do harness this, many of which don't. So he not only came up with the idea of games with a purpose, but also many of the principles by which online games became more fun. So if you've ever done the ones where you draw pictures together, or you try to guess words together, or things like that, many of those are just there to get you to use the site so they can sell you advertising and make money, and they're not harnessing the back end. Okay? 
Uh, his newest system was deployed actually in 2012. It's called Duolingo. Um, Duolingo, have anyone here used it? Wow. <laughs> he told me it was getting popular, I didn't realize it that much. Um, okay, so now I have to use English words that are only in Duolingo. Well, we need to learn German, so. Right. Well, I was using it yesterday to try to learn German, and I can now say Machen, Junge, and uh, Rot. So, so it really works. I, I, I didn't have the same friend before. Um, but actually, but interestingly, there's a lot of things that had to be added. So, for example, if you've, known, if you've used Duolingo, you'll notice there's now a discussion page behind every example. So, my second German lesson, right, it gave me the exam, it asked me how to say, um, it was a girl and a, a man, right? And it had just taught me a moment ago that female was I know and male was I, right? But for mention, it was I, right? And it just says, no, you're wrong, it's I. And I clicked on the discussion, it says, here's the rule in German about why those wo certain words that are clearly gendered really aren't, we don't use that. Right? So again, so he realized even in the very simple stuff, people would need people need to understand what's behind some of the rules, not just the rules. Instead of putting them all in, he just set it up so people could discuss it themselves. And very often the native speakers of one language who are learning another sort of help the people in the other language. So those learning German who speak English are helping those learning English who speak German learn about the languages together. And as you go higher and higher in the system, there's more. Now, originally, his, his goal was that he would use this to translate sentences uh, and eventually documents. So right now, you pay a lot of money to get a document translated of high quality. It's essentially free to throw it through something like Google Translate. But it's worth the money when you're, for example, a government that has, so the EU government has to publish in many languages. Every, every law. And getting those translation rights is very, very important. So there are many people working on that problem, and they're paid quite well. <coughs> His idea was, could we get these groups of people who are learning the language to actually be helping to translate these documents? Now, somewhere around 2014, he said that was no longer what they were using it for. They were using it for other kinds of language translation. I haven't seen anything printed since then when he's talked about what the economic model behind this. But what he's got is a very large community of people who get value because instead of paying for language lessons like you have to do in many other systems, you get them for free. But he is harnessing your learning of the language to help do something in the back end that's improving uh, language learning, it's, um, I know it's been used, one of his original goals was to translate all of the Spanish Wikipedia pages into, all of the English Wikipedia pages into Spanish, I don't know how many chapters, but I know there have been quite a few, so that was sort of his, um, when you go to a funding agent, you can't say, I'm going to make a lot of money off of it, you've got to say, I'm going to do something useful and meaningful, so he told the National Science Foundation would be using it to translate the, the Spanish Wikipedia pages. Now, that is, quite a few languages and things like that. Okay, another system I'm sure we'll hear more about um, in the rest of the day is something called Galaxy Zoo. So, how many of you know Galaxy Zoo? I, I'm not sure why it's already been covered, but not too much. All right, so Galaxy Zoo. Yeah, I figured you know that. Um, so Galaxy Zoo is an interesting system. So Galaxy Zoo, what happened was um, the Hubble telescope at night is pointed to the sky, just to the blank sky. So, so the astronomical background of this is quite interesting, and, and I'm tempted to digress for a long time, but won't. But roughly speaking, when you look up the sky, you see parts that have a whole lot of stars in them and parts without too much. And for many years, as astronomers got more and more powerful telescopes, they tended to point them at the places where the stars were where you saw those clusters and analyzed what was going on there. And at some point, somebody had the idea, you know, what if we pointed it at those empty parts of the sky? As we have more and more power, we can see things further away and better. Discovered lots of stuff out there. 
And so when the Hubble Space Telescope was used, at, at, parts of the, uh, at parts of the day, uh, funded by the Sloan Foundation, it actually, so if, an astronom if some astronomers say, we want it pointed at this phenomena which we're studying, points to this. But whenever it wasn't doing that, what it's doing is it's just taking pictures of the whole sky. So it's called the Sloan Sky Survey. And one of the things you get in the Sloan Sky Survey um, is pictures like this which are galaxies. So, so one of the things that came out when people started pointing at these dark parts of the sky was that there were many, many more galaxies than we knew. And a lot of astronomy theories would predict whether you would expect those galaxies to all be of the same kind, all be of different kinds, split evenly between them. And so they decided, now that we've got the pictures of these millions and millions of galaxies, we can start labeling, we can start deciding which kind they were. Now, the problem they ran into is they were finding literally tens of millions of these galaxies. And the way you traditionally got these things labeled is you paid grad students to do it. Right? Now, grad students are, are not paid very much. Uh, you guys are one of the cheapest forms of labor yeah. around. <laughs> but, uh, but you still cost a lot more than can be used for tens of millions of galaxies. Uh, not to mention you needed a lot of grad students, and there weren't that many astronomy grad students hanging around at the time. So they came up, but they, so people started trying to write computer programs, and there's really only a few kinds of, uh, of these galaxies. So what are called smooth galaxies, feature galaxies, spiral galaxies, and disk galaxies. And so spirals are the ones that kind of look like they have little arms coming out of them, and, and disks are, are flatter. And, and they knew that many galaxies fell into these two categories. There's a theory in terms of how the uh, universe evolved that they should be about even. So they really wanted to count. So what they realized is, so, so getting computers to recognize some of these subtle differences is very hard. People can do it very easily. They're very good at pattern recognition. Now that's changing a little bit. And I'll talk a little bit about that later in the talk. But, um, but they really, so, so, so the problem was you were getting about an 80 to 85 percent correctness rate when you used just pure image recognition out The problem is you needed this higher than 80 to 85 percent because if you said uh, we're finding 48 percent in favor of spiral and 52 percent in favor of disk galaxies, then you would say, ah, the theory was wrong. But if you found uh, and, and this galaxy would leave the galaxy. Um, but the um, but if you were if, if you were all that that twenty percent margin could be the difference between whether there really were pretty much the same number or a significant difference. Okay, and that significant difference was enough to would would change basically models of astronomy. So they really wanted to get these things counted. So. Uh, they actually tried creating a game around this, and focus groups said, I don't want to play a game, I want to do science. So they actually came up with a site, this was the early part of the site, was you would sort of sign on, and it would give you a little bit of training. It would say, this, look at this galaxy, this is this kind of galaxy, look at this. It'd take about 10 minutes, and thereafter, you could go in, and you could just, when you had some free time, label some galaxies. And they added a few other interesting features, like being able to say, you know, what is this thing, or I'm not sure. So the idea was now, most of the pictures would get labeled by people um, for free. The ones that people said, I'm not sure about, those would go to the astronomy grad students who would really look at them using their knowledge of astronomy, where some of these things could be subtle. Um, turned out there also were some really interesting things that came out in the HCI, the human computer interaction literature. Now this, so in the early testing of this, it turns out that um, spiral galaxies were, were looking like there were going to be something like 80% of the galaxies, which would have just been all of everything we knew about astronomy was wrong. And the, the guys who were behind this, the, the people writing the program, were pretty sure something was wrong there. So it turns out if you give people three choices, so it was, in this case it was, Disk galaxy, spiral galaxy, I don't know. 
that when they're not sure, or when they're just, if they're just sort of being random, they'll click the middle. So they learned they had to actually, in the interface, randomize the order and things like that, because of natural, people were trying to go very fast and weren't paying a lot of time. So again, if you want to do these, there's a lot of subtleties. But they worked this out, they tested it, they got it pretty good. Uh, their goal was to get 60 million galaxies labeled, and they, they, re, they thought maybe they could get that done in a couple years. Uh, within about, I think it was six months of the actual launch, they had already reached the 60 million they were going for, and they went way beyond it. So in other words, they discovered this was a very valuable way to get uh, work done. I'll make that in a second. Um, they've expanded it now, so if you go to Zooniverse, so it's Galaxy Zoo became Zooniverse, uh, they now have all sorts of things you can do. So these are the first three, these are a few pages, they're project pages. And you can say things like, um, uh, you can't read them here, but things like, this is uh, decipher old manuscripts, uh, help identify animals, um, astronomical ones. I found it interesting that the very last one in the whole system now is, is Galaxy Zoo itself. So lots and lots of things they're pushing across dozens of different fields. Um, they have some funding to help make it possible to make these things easier and easier people to use. Some of them that don't show up here were become more advanced. So once you've done them for one of them for a while, it'll offer you something more complicated. And, and a lot of stuff to study this. I'll come back to some of the things about the communities later, but one of the most famous examples was um, this example. This is the case of uh, what's called Hani's Verwerk, which is, uh, I can't pronounce it right, but it's the Dutch word for thing. So Hani's thing, Hani's weird object. And what happened was this woman who is a, uh, a school teacher in the Netherlands was every morning before she went to school would do these labelings for a while. And one day she saw that picture that's up in that corner asking her to label that galaxy. But she said, hmm, this green thing down here is something I've never seen before. So she went to the thing called call an astronomer, you know, tell an astronomer about it. And she said, watch this green thing. And so that got to some astronomy graduate student at some point, and the astronomy graduate student looked at it and said, well, what's this green thing? So he went to his professor, and they went to other professors. And eventually, this was uh, the discovery of something called a quasar light echo. And somebody explained it to me once, and, and I will tell you that I'm not even going to try. <laughs> but roughly speaking, it turns out that when certain things happen astronomically, you can create these things, and now they have found more of them. So they named it after the discoverer, which is something that has traditionally been done in astronomy. There are many people out at night who scan the skies. If you find a new comet and you're the first one to do it, they name it after you, right? So you know what's the chances that you're going to find a new comet? Not very high, but a lot of people do. And then, again, it's not so much because they want to have a comet named after them, they love to, or that they expect to find. It's just they like looking for comments, and by the way, they might. And so they were realizing that they could use some of those same kind of things. And um, it, it, it's wonderful. If you look at this paper closely, you'd see that pretty much everyone on that list is a, um, is a famous astronomer. And they're from Department of Physics, University of Oxford, Department of Physics, Yale University. And the fourth one is Hani van Arkel from the Netherlands school system. <laughs> so Hani is actually now has a very high, uh, has three very highly cited papers, right, in astronomy. Um, you can also buy coffee mugs. With the, they, they exploited this for everything that's working. You can get t-shirts, coffee mugs. In fact, some of the success of the Zooniverse was the attention they attracted off of this particular thing. So incentives for getting people to use these things is still something that's very complicated and in the research space. And this is just an example of where something that incentivized many, many people wasn't really designed into the system, but emerged by accident. Okay. Many of these systems are now being deployed that are still, again, primarily not so much the interactive system. Oh, I'm sorry, I should say one other thing. Um, remember that idea of the computer 
Uh, the human are doing the creative thing, the things that's hard for the computer. The computer is doing the administrative stuff, the stuff that's hard for the human, right? So built into the Galaxy Zoo, so if you looked at this and you clicked one of these buttons and they just assumed you were correct, that would probably be a bad idea, right? Because again, people sometimes go fast, people make mistakes. So they actually have built into this several mechanisms for, for quality control based on traditional scientific methods. So one of the things is cross-rater validation. So what will happen is this same thing will be shown to many different people. And if, if I, I think it's, it, it starts, it falls to about 10, and if eight of them agree, it, agree it, it, it says that's good enough, right? So it'll go into the categorization and only, and, and uh, or some, some variant of that, so some threshold is but the other thing is, it can actually show these same things from different viewpoints of things. So the same person, if you're using it a lot, you'll actually see the same galaxy multiple times from different views. So it's also saying, is this person trustworthy? So over time, you're getting a rater reliability as well as this interrelate, like inter-rater reliability. And that technique has come to be used in many systems. In fact, uh, those of you who use Uber, or Airbnb, where you rate the service and the service provider rates you, they're doing some of that same, they're using some of the same computational engine at the bottom to say, you know, are these people, so, so if one taxi driver says, one, one Uber driver says you're a bad customer, but the others say you're okay, right, your, your rating will stay high. If a bunch of them say you're bad, you'll go down. And vice versa, if you don't like one, that won't, kill their rating, but if a bunch of people don't like it. So, so again, these techniques of cross-rating, cross-validation, et cetera, got, ex got explored in these systems where you have lots of people using them and became part of the technology underlying computers. So um, we also talked, you'll recall in the definition, about using these things for social good. And there's many examples of this. Much of this was launched jointly with the open government movement. So many of these things, some of these things came about through other routes, some of them through open government. Um, one that's very well known now is called Lusha, Lusha Kibi, which is, um, was originally came about because you had these things going on in various war zones and things, and people could take pictures with their phones or could make reports verbally, and these would get reported to the net, and reporters wanted to know what was going on there. So I can't get into uh, Syria to find out what's going on. How could I know what's happening on the ground in Syria? Well, one possibility is let the people who are reporting but back. But of course, that's a system some people want to game and things. But, and I don't mean that in the good sense. That, uh, people want to cheat. I'm the Syrian government. I'd like you to think nothing. I'm the Syrian opposition. I might. Well, you think about it. But in some places, like the Haitian earthquake, which is where this was one of the systems that really, really showed itself, um, the idea is I just need to know what's going on as best I can, and the people who are on the ground are fair. Whether they're trustworthy or not, that's a lot better than what I'm getting from outside. So, um, the Shahidi just basically takes the reports correlates them in very simple ways and puts them on a map. So now you can see there's a lot of reports of violence happening in this part of the country. Things like that. And they can map to different levels and things like that. It, it was based on some of the things underlying open street maps. So there's been a lot of different things. It has expanded now, has been used in many humanitarian crises. Um, a favorite site that people talk about this stuff is an Indian site called I, I Paid a Bribe. Though. I paid a bribe basically just lets you report two things. One is when you pay the bribe, you know, somebody asked me for a bribe. The other one is because it was actually fairly rare in some parts of India, you could say, I had a really good experience with a cop who didn't ask me for a bribe. So you could report honest cops, right? And they, they categorize these and things like that. And you can, um, if you can see the numbers up there. But, um, when it was first deployed, it got a lot of use. It's actually fallen into less use now for various reasons. One of those reasons is because the system was used enough that it actually, people stopped. It, it pushed the bribery to a different, it kind of pushed it underground more, but in a positive way. So many things for which cops were asking for bribes, they stopped. 
because it was getting reported so much, where it had always been just assumed. Also turned out, it created um, a very strange effect. The woman who created the site was gave a talk on it. That was wonderful. And one thing she said was, you know, nobody knew how much other people were paying in bribes. And so the corrupt officials were taking advantage of that. So you would walk in looking like a poor graduate student and say, oh, it will be 50 rupees if you want that license. And I would look in, walk in looking like the, an American who didn't know anything. Oh, you know, those licenses are 5,000 rupees, right? Um, or you were wealthy and you know, trying to get a marriage certificate for your daughter. That turned out to be one of the first things reported in these. But the prices were all over the place. Well, for this, people start saying, wait a minute, 5,000 rupees? This guy only had to pay 200 rupees. And so it actually created a, a, a market. Uh, that drove the cost of bronze down. So, so the free market economists love this site. Uh, but it also, in some parts of India, where they were trying, where the, um, so the different states it was taken very differently. There are some states where they tried to outlaw it, but they couldn't because it was out on the web. There were some states that took this very seriously and started looking at these reports and saying, hey, you know, people are reporting that every time anyone parks in this area, they're getting hit up for money if they don't want their car towed away, even though it's legal. So they started sending inspectors there and things like that, and policemen started going to jail for asking for the cop, for, or, or getting fired for asking for the bribes, so it brought down the number of bribes in many areas. So yeah, a wonderful example. Another famous example is a, a site called Patients Like Me. Uh, Patients Like Me, you go online if you, have a, if, if you either have a medicine you're taking, a disease you're fighting with, things basically just a, I say just, it, it's basically a social networking site, blogging site, Harrison site, um, and originally it was primarily used by patients, but over time, it's really grown. So, so um, last time I did a check, this was about a month or two ago, had over 400,000 members talking about 2,500 different disease types, but doctors had started coming to it and interacting with us. So instead of always doing things through a clinical trial where you get, you know, you have to try different drugs, they would go to these sites and say, hey, you know, a lot of people with this condition are reporting that when they take this other drug, they're actually getting a lot of relief. Let's go study what's going on there. And um, so there have been more than 80 published research studies there. And they talk about having 35 million data points about disease. So when you come to do research, you can now start your research data up and say, you know, if my theory is correct, then I should be seeing a correlation between diabetics and people having the following kind of problems. There's a, a study going on right now that says type 2 diabetes and certain kinds of bone conditions should be linked if a particular genetic theory is correct. So they're actually looking through this data, but also more, more formal uh, medical data, to try to see if they can find that correlation. So it does, that correlation doesn't prove the theory, but if that correlation isn't there, it would be very hard to argue for the theory. The theory would have to be much more complicated. Okay, so, so let me talk a little bit about artificial intelligence and social machines. This isn't really the focus of today's uh, talk, but it's actually, an interesting thing happening at the moment in that space as well. You've been reading many articles about the increasing capabilities of artificial intelligence. Turns out it's very tied to this. Um, this, was, this paper is there mostly. This is not read that paper um, because this thing doesn't have the kind of citations that, that are worth bragging about. But because it reminds me to talk about a particular thing, which is that um, one is this is the paper that actually came out of that grant we wrote. So no good piece of Nothing you write should ever go to waste. But um, more importantly, um, Stefan mentioned semantic web as the basis for some of this. This was a different idea. This was an idea that um, not just semantics are needed here, but also the ability. So if you want to create a crowdsourcing site, if you want to create one of these social media sites, it's a fairly complicated web process. But the web part isn't the hard part. The hard part is these things like the cross validations and things like that. So what we were arguing in here was we should be building automated tools to 
that people could sort of have as a library on which to build these social machines. Now, a lot of that work has been done, and I assume you'll be hearing about that later in the day. I could, sort of. <laughs> uh, and again, there's still a lot to do in there, but the idea was to, that if we could make some of this stuff declarative, so instead of having to write programs, people could just say, set it up sort of like this, put the Lego blocks together this way, and would, I'd get a site that would be a starting place, that would be really useful. So, uh, talking about modern AI, there's a lot of stuff going on. So, for example, when you use search, it's now based on something called the knowledge graph. So when you search for me, it shows you people who search for Jim have also searched for these people. If you do it today, you'll get a different answer than you got yesterday. Uh, if you do it on your machine, you'll get a different answer than you do it on my machine. Lots and lots of personalization that's happening on search. But what's interesting is, all of these automated processes being used by Facebook, being used by Google, being used by many, many other sites, they still have humans in the loop, right? So among the many techniques they're using to tell if the stuff is working and to fix mistakes are humans, and that's because this stuff can be really hard. Uh, these are a couple of examples from the paper Peter Mika gave. Um, these are a couple of my favorites. He had a lot of them. So one is, um, this is the, the rap singer called Ice Cube. And so it's about Ice Cube, he's five foot seven, and his spouse is Kimberly Wood, and has all sorts of information. But then in the description it says, an ice cube is a small, roughly cube-shaped piece of ice, frozen water, conventionally used to cool beverages. Right? There's not an error there, but it seems odd that you would use those two together. Right? A better one might be this one. So this is the uh, page of Michelangelo. Now, now, those of you who know the Teenage, the teenage Ninja Turtles know that the four turtles were named after four uh, Renaissance artists. It turns out that if you actually search the web, you will find that the, the associations between Michelangelo, Raphael, Donatello, and... Um, I'm sorry? Did, did you say Michelangelo? Michael, Michelangelo, Donatello, Leonardo. Leonardo, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> see, I'm giving you away. I'm, crowds I'm crowdsourcing. <laughs> um, that they're actually far more correlated in turtle space than they are in artist space. Right? They always show up together in movies, comic books, TV shows, cartoons, and they only sometimes show up together in museums and, and art books and things like that. So in fact, um, it also turned out that um, when the Watson computer was being tested, it made mistakes on, on these two. So it, it, most of what I knew about Renaissance artists, even though it had pages and pages full of actual information about Renaissance artists, got, got all this associational information from the web would cause you to do these associations. So, so computer processes that are working off of statistical things happening in society can be biased by those things happening in society, like the, the four turtles being named after the four artists. So, so some of you, if not all of you, are familiar with the IBM Watson system. Watson you know, flew to fame because in 2011, it played a, a game show called Jeopardy against two humans who had been previously the two best Jeopardy players in the world. Um, the guy on the, uh, the left, if you face the screen, is a guy named Ken Jennings. Ken was, is universally believed to be the best Jeopardy player ever. There's a guy who, who now some people think is almost as, he's sort of like, if, if you were talking about basketball, he said Michael Jordan. He was like, we get it. There's no one else. I don't know football well enough. In fact, he's probably used to be, but I don't know if he's getting off. He's not the one anymore. But um, so in a two-game series, uh, Watson beat these two, and it was it was a very complex, carefully done thing. And I'm not going to go into the underlying technology. That's the that's the other talk I would give if I had more time. Uh, and that's the talk I would give at some place like it's kind of what was going on here? Why did these things do so well? how do we use that, those techniques. But, but here's the interesting thing. The main, one of the biggest heuristics, one of the most useful things 
underneath Watson was the information in Wikipedia. Okay, so you have Watson, which is the same as AI computer, sitting on top of Wikipedia, which is written, which is articles written by people. That's not written by computers. Okay, well, Wikipedia in turn is sitting on top of some of a computer program, which is MediaWiki. So MediaWiki has been around long, before, you know, from uh, actually started in the 70s and 80s. So free web. Wikis became more popular when they got tied to websites. And the idea of this encyclopedia based on the wiki, uh, based particularly on this particular media wiki, was done. And you can go on. So Wikipedia has a lot of policies, there's feedback mechanisms. So, um, so, so Wikipedia uses computers to do a lot of things, but humans to check them and vice versa. So this is, um, this was a great picture shared with me by Denny Vendra. Written. I can't pass. Denny was. Uh, no, 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 no. He gave it to me. Okay. Uh, because you have to be a certain level of Wikipedia user before you can get access to these tools. He was the only one. He went and worked for Wikipedia. Now he works for this little company called Google, which is. By now, some of this. Those of you who've heard of DDPedia and the semantic web space, uh, it's tied into some of these. Uh, it was also tied into the Watson Web and some of these things. But what this shows you is an article in Wikipedia. So you can go to Wikipedia and you can click on history and you can see a step at a time everybody who's changed an article. And then you can compare one or two of them at a time. But what a Wikipedia editor can get is this picture of the history. Okay? Uh, uh, um, and what, what, this, what, what this does is it's showing you each of those colors is essentially a, a piece of the text in an article. So the article was growing nicely until, you know, here people added this, someone added the blue stuff, then someone added the green stuff, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now you'll notice something starts to happen here. And what that is is somebody puts something in, somebody takes it out, somebody else puts it back in, someone else takes it back out. So a wiki war started. So you, Using your perceptual pattern, take one look at that and you say, there's a wiki word going on here. Right? But what is it about? Well, if you can't read the words, if you can't look at it, unfortunately you can't read those off to the side, um, uh, this is where that more detailed information is. And what you discover is, um, you know, what is, what, is the, what is the topic that could be this controversial? This is the base for chocolate. Right? And it was an argument over a particular study that kind of showed stuff that might be good for you, it might not be good for you, and there was some argument going on. So you can imagine what a political one, or one about football, or something like that looks like. Even something as seemingly non-controversial as chocolate. It also turns out, um, I don't have the other pictures, but there are things like, you know, how can you detect vandalism? Well, all of a sudden, something is growing, growing, and something shrinks tremendously. Or changes. So this isn't good for subtle things, but it's good for other things. So what happens now in Wikipedia is computers are used heavily uh, in the form of software robots, bots, that actually go through. Um, so and, and they'll actually fix things and then sort of put them into a queue for a human to look at later. And one of the things that will happen is if you think it was wrong, so I create a page. The bot deletes it. I, I have a place where I go to a talk page and say, hey, it shouldn't have been deleted. And you can put some special stuff in there, and some human will come look at it. So you, the, the, the Wikipedia has gotten too big for humans to, to manage totally by themselves. So they're managing it with the help of computers. But the computers aren't good enough, so they're using humans. So you can see we have, we, we refer to this as embracing the blur. Right? The, you really, it's hard to look at a system like Wikimedia or a modern complex social machine and say, where exactly is the machine and where is the people? There's a blurring. There's a, there's, these things are built and become interdependent. And that's really the direction we're going uh, with some of these things. So, so let me finish by talking a little bit about the scientific agenda that underlies this stuff. Uh, so first of all, to really understand these things, we're talking about something that's inherently multidisciplinary. So you have, you know, sort of computer algorithms, 
You have math and analysis and theory that underlies so how do we build these things? But then you have the whole rules of social science and communication, economics, so again, incentives and things like this. Um, people have studied the mechanisms behind this. So for example, if we look at Wikipedia, uh, this is their model of, of who can do what. If you look at Slashdot, and actually Red is very similar, what you see is it's not really the same. They've added a different layer in there. So when you look at these things and analyze what's going on in the systems, you see different structures. Okay. Another good example is this picture from um, a study of a graduate student, now a professor named Panamatawa, um, did, was she looked at the different communities involved in so to make, uh, I'm sorry, in Galaxy Zoo. So to make Galaxy Zoo work, you needed humans and machines, but you needed different communities of them. So you needed, you had places where you needed expert knowledge. You had places, so astronomers and physicists. You had places where you needed human knowledge, but this was sort of the public. You had places where you needed the AI that was sort of doing the, um, the so, so when you first actually identified which part which picture should I show people because they have galaxies in them? They're actually doing that using computers. So the computer is sort of looking at the sky and saying, I think this is a galaxy, I think this is a galaxy. But you've got the people who are saying, it's this kind of galaxy, it's that kind of galaxy, et cetera, et cetera. So you have public, you have website developers, you have the astronomers up top who actually are, are were doing things off of the Hubble telescope. You have the group that was developing galaxies to help them, and it turned out that the success of this thing was a, a close interaction between all those different communities. The astronomers didn't just say, we'll deploy the site, we'll ask people to, to do things and we'll never talk to them again, right? You wouldn't have had that in the world without that, that you're allowed to talk back to me. Um, incentivization, things like this. I'm not going to talk about this, but another whole set of things going on in the social machine is what's called self organized social machines. So um, those of you who've heard of, uh, it's primarily an oriental phenomenon called the human flesh search, which is a te terrible name. It's the literal translation of the um, Chinese characters that really would, say, would be, be better called people-powered search engine. Right. But it's essentially, um, people would go online and say, hey, something bad happened. And other people around China would help them try to solve the problem. And it was happening on chat groups. And the government kept trying to shut it down, but couldn't because there wasn't a site. It was many different sites. And people who used this thing sort of knew how to find each other. And eventually, it started becoming a force for good. So people started actually using it, uh, doing things. So um, some of the stuff like I paid or Brian, things like that. But it also got very interesting because as well as being used for social good, it got used not, not exactly for entertainment, but for sort of what you might call internet stardom. So somebody would take a picture of someone and say, you know, look at this really good looking woman who's sitting in this coffee shop. And then a bunch of other people would say, oh, I know who that is. And that person would actually end up on TV or radio sometimes. So it was a way to develop stardom. So, so the problem is the system is easily corrupted in a certain sense. People can use it for things. And, other, and, and so the community self-corrects. Uh, and there's a lot of famous examples on that. Again, there are papers on this. I won't go into it. But at, in, in studies of this, you really find many, many of the features of uh, social networking and crowdsourcing, et cetera, coming up but without that organized website. Okay. Another thing that's interesting, again, I was just talking about the different ways you can study these. It turns out these different kinds of sites have the same basic. So everyone says, you know, um, all of this web stuff is what's called small world scale free. That's the math underneath it for those of you who like math and physics. That's that. But there are tremendous differences between blogs, wikis, community question answering, uh, social networks, um, before they started adding a lot of the feedback, and things like the human flesh search. So again, there's, there's a level of similarity, but a lot of levels of difference. So people who are looking at these social media analytics are starting to look at some of the differences. Okay. Of uh, any social challenges, so what are the dynamics, right? What are the incentives people use? What kind of information flows do you have between the online and offline? So again, 
Galaxy Zoo, the computer isn't making up the things it's showing you. It's bringing things from the Hubble Sky cell, telescope, right? Um, the pictures that were being fed into games for the purpose, the ESP game, were pictures that, that event that originally got on and later Google wanted to get labeled. In fact, um, those of you who know about deep learning systems and know you can go find libraries full of things like these are pictures of ducks and these are pictures of cats and all of that stuff, many, many of those tags came from, uh, from variants of the ESP game. So again, you use people to create the labels that the systems are learning from. Uh, you get issues of trust and distrust. Uh, so how do you prevent um, abuses? Why is trust? There's, again, whole, whole books on social trust online. And that's a critical issue. If I'm going to create one of these and tell you it's helping people, you need to believe me that it's helping people. And how do I show you it really is? What's the feedback that I mean? What's the transparency that I mean? And, and governance. I mentioned you and Flesser to self-organizing. Wikipedia has many things. It turns out, if you look at most of these sites, as they grow, they periodically have to have a whole bunch of new management structure or policies added, uh, or they don't keep growing. So there are clearly scaling factors going on in here. So you and Flesser, very rarely did they get bigger than a certain size, and the hypothesis is that simply because there's just a limit of what can be done without somebody who's been for to come in and be able to say, all right, this is getting out of hand. I'm allowed to, to control something. Um, Wikipedia, again, lots of rules, privileged people. So in 2008, there was a paper that talked about 44 policies. And this was, I think, 2012. I upgraded that I went down to 51. 248 guidelines I've done 400. I looked recently. That's about. Um, uh, again, they, they, they've made it so it's not, they don't label policy, policy, and that guideline where it's more complicated. But there's literally hundreds and hundreds of pages of, of the rules of Wikipedia. So if you go to create a new page, a bio for someone, it will very rapidly suggest to you, you've got to go look at this stuff we talked about. How do we define what's an important person that's important enough for Wikipedia? Right. So you can't just go create a, uh, you know, hey, my friend Bill, I like Bill, let me give him a Wikipedia page. In the early days, you could. And it was sort of this assumption that anybody who, you, could, you weren't allowed to do your own. That was the only rule. And even that can be broken occasionally. So um, there's that. I mentioned these before. So again, the, the, if, if we're going to have it so that people are, are programming these things, You've got to make the programming easier if you're going to have more of them. Uh, designing a successful game is still very difficult. It's creating tools. Um, what are the underlying models? What are some of the engineering challenges? So, so to conclude, right, what we see happening now is we are on developing. So I was trying to edit something here. So we're in a time where there are these technologies that are creating, we are creating, I'm supposed to be, web-based systems that can trans, oh, I had two things open at the same time, and I, was, I fixed the wrong one. So that's always the fun of doing this. So we humans are really good at doing that, making errors. And uh, let's not go there. So, so, one other thing we're looking at is so how can we create these systems that allow large numbers of users to interact over the web to collectively solve problems? We're creating and disseminating new web applications, development technologies, et cetera, to help communities spend these, and uh, AI may be an important part of that. Again, if I had another two hours, I'd be happy to go with that. Um, there's a lot of important examples out there. So it's no longer the case that there aren't things to look at. Now, what is hard is it's very hard to do anything experimental. So while we can talk about quantitative results, because we could study what a million people did in, in one of these sites, in reality, it's, it's really qualitative, because all we can talk about is what happened on that site. It's very difficult to do anything where we say, take a successful site like patients like me, and let's say, what would happen if we had some of the patients start lying? Well, that would be a very bad thing to do. Right. What, what would happen if it had a different network structure? So what would happen if instead of being 
this kind of network was that kind. So, so would memes propagate the same in Twitter if it wasn't a small world? Right? You can hear arguments about it, but you can't actually go to Twitter and say, would everyone please unfriend all but a thousand, you know, and would everyone please have a hundred friends for the next two days? So we can study some. Right? So again, it's very hard to do research in some of these things to really nail it down. And so what we're seeing is many of the techniques of social science uh, coming in to many of the techniques of network science, web science, et cetera. So I know I know um, not here to talk about some of that the first day. Um, so there are these truly interdisciplinary challenges out there where we really need to put these things together because if you can get this right, the power to really attack hard problems is there. And in, in, in one of my talks, I don't know if this one, I sort of like to end with, you know, the future is full of these really, really complicated problems facing society. And what we really need to do is create networks with the best minds on the planet. The thing is, those best minds may not only be humans now. They're going to be humans assisted by and eventually augmented with computing. And so how do we put those things together? How do we make it so that even if the computer is just doing the, the stuff about making sure that the, the galaxies are being fairly marked? In almost any um, game with a purpose, you have some people who are just trying to run up scores. Uh, one that I found really interesting is, you know, there's these protein folding things where you can let your system, when it's idle, actually <laughs> run someone else's code. Well, it turned out there were people who were actually putting machines, like full racks of machines, and pretending they were doing it. In fact, well, they were, because you got points for the more of them you did. So people find ways to cheat lots of these systems so they can go up on the leaderboard because they're not thinking of it as a way to solve a problem. They're thinking, if you make the game, they're thinking about it as a way to win the game. So again, you have these, these different tensions and things that we're looking at here, all of which is required to really understand these things. So I'll stop there. Thank you. And uh, I'll take questions. I could do much better if I was awake. But not here yet. Um, I was told to give this to people asking questions. I think one of the big uh, potentials, personally, that uh, as an adaptive, it appears, is uh, using this sort of thing for psychology. Uh, so you can... Anyways, uh, I mean, do you know of any uh, that use this sort of technology for psychology? Also, I want to mention, uh, you could experiment in some ways for instance, the affordances of the site, but see how that changes, like yes. using testing, you know, but, um, yeah, especially like emotion recognition or uh, yeah. you know, predicting uh, when two people are fighting each other or not. Uh, I think you can do that very easily. Uh, right. So let me, let me um, take, take those two questions, questions separately. So, so the first one was, has it been used in psychology? And the answer is yes to some degree. But um, it gets it's very complicated when you get into anything that's going to require personal information, medical information, et cetera. So, you know, if I wanted people to look at behaviors and say what's well, abnormal and what's normal, and then you're, you're going into some very ethically charged uh, grounds. So there have been some efforts in there. Um, I can't remember. I don't think the current Zooniverse has any thing in it. You could easily check the website and see. But um, what I do know is that there's some efforts now by some mental health professionals to try to bring some of this stuff into the U.S. medical system. So what happens is, is when you actually go to a doctor for your yearly checkup, you ask two questions that relate to mental health. I mean, one is, are you depressed? And I forget what the other, are you having any marital problems? Right? Uh, if you're and that's it. And if you answer no to both of them, does go on. There's a bunch of um, people over in the mental health side who develop hundreds and hundreds of these questions that they would like everyone to ask. Of course, it's too hard to ask everybody all those questions because doctors are trying to minimize the amount of expense. So they feel that many, many mental health problems are not being diagnosed. So there's a whole effort now to try to figure out 
could you put some of this stuff online? Could it be that when the doctor says, you know, when, when you're coming for your yearly checkup, as well as doing uh, this thing where you fill out, you know, sort of diseases you had and things like that, would you mind taking this web questionnaire about just some of your factors in your life? Right, so now you're, you've gotten around some of the ethical issues because you're doing it for the doctor's office, things like that. So there is a lot of discussion of it. I don't know if anyone has really tried this scalable um, crowdsourcing in there. The other question was about doing experiments in it, and, and that has been done. So um, a very famous, um, very famous experiment was by, done by a guy named Duncan Watt. And so what he did is he took a music recommender site and he developed it in just four different variants. And the only thing that was different in it was how it portrayed the information that was um, used. And he opened the site and when you, you came to it, it said, this site is to help you choose music and share with your friends, blah, blah, blah. And by the way, you're also taking an experiment. You have to click permission. So he went through all the um, review boards and things like that. So it was well performed. Um, and it was fascinating because he found very small changes, like whether you highlighted X versus Y, had huge impact on whether people trusted it, on whether people used it, et cetera. Problem is, if you have a, a successful one of these going, so like Wikipedia, right? Wikipedia, you can sort of do small experiments, but what happens if those experiments cause the content value to go down when, when why people are using your entire site is because they trust the content. So it's very hard to do experiments. Uh, Facebook has gotten, you know, significant bad publicity for some of the work they've done, where they've manipulated things within the uh, recommendations. And so when you receive, when the, so so many people are putting information in Facebook and picking why it shows you, even if you don't have very many friends, they claim we can't show you everything. So they have an algorithm doing it, and they wanted to study whether that algorithm was actually biasing things. And, and so, so they had a sentiment detector, so they were using, using the, the different sentiments. So, so we, we estimate that these are, are sort of happy articles and these are unhappy articles, right? And they were actually, for some users, showing them more of the happy ones and showing more of the unhappy ones. So they were able to get some really interesting effects about happy and unhappy. But boy, when it came out that they had done that study, people were really, really angry because they don't want people manipulating them. They, they think of the Facebook stream as a trusted intermediary. And now suddenly Facebook is saying, well, you can't really trust us. We might be experimenting. So uh, they lost, they, the estimate is they've lost hundreds of thousands of users, right? Which for them is a small amount, but it was still a big chunk. So, and they really have worked very hard now to say we won't do that kind of experiment anymore, things like that. Um, but of course, internally, they have to be doing they're, they're, they're not really necessarily experimenting with um, emotions and things like that anymore. They are looking at things like um, if we use this algorithm versus that algorithm, do people like what they're seeing more? You know, are you seeing more clicks or people staying on the table? Things like that. So you could argue that's to help the users as well as to help them with their advertising. They've just announced they're moving to a whole new system that no one has quite understood because the press releases on it are. are Pretty. Uh, the press when they hear something from Facebook or Twitter, that you're sitting there like, that can't be what Facebook says, you know, anything about technology. So it's somehow that they're going to be making the feed bit more about what your friends and family are doing than, than advertising. So, so essentially, they did a survey, and they found a lot of people were complaining about the number of ads and where they were showing up and how they were showing up. So they decided to move the ads away from the feed. So you'll see more ads elsewhere on the site and less ads actually in the feed, things like that. So again, so you can do some of that experimentation, but it's very hard. And you need a lot of people. But Google, every search you do, um, potentially goes to 20 different variants. And some of them are, are, are not shown to you. So um, they're taking, so this is what the person searched for. And these were the top results, and they're showing them to a group of people who evaluate them. And those people are saying, oh, I like this one better than that one. Then and the ones that are top of those start getting deployed to small groups, and that does ad maps, so A-B testing and things like that. You'll hear a lot of terminology about this. 
Not so much of that has been used in the social machine space. Again, because you're someone who's trying to do good, you don't think of it as sort of something you want to uh, experiment with. On the, the other hand, as they get successful, Wikipedia has done some of that as sort of natural experiment. They've had to figure out what works and doesn't work so that they can keep growing. So again, it's, it's a lot has been done in that space, but not that much of it has been well-controlled, scientific, well-understood, et cetera. And that's really the challenge, is how do we learn how to do these things better if we can't really do anything other than see how they did when we, we put them out. I know one of the groups in here is going to be looking at, at some things related to that. Sort of, um, what are some of the factors outside marketing that might cause when something succeeds and when it doesn't? I mean, do we even have the right tools to study the systems and their successes? Because at this point, I'm not quite sure you sort of like, did you tell me, well, you're interested in this, this part of this crowdsourcing space, how to analyze what makes a successful system? Right, so, so the qu question for those who come here is, um, you know, what, you know, it's hard to study these things, what makes for it. Yeah, you know, in, in the, um, the recent web science conference, there were a couple papers <coughs> looking at sort of, just trying to analyze what are some of the factors we can even look at. Um, I, I was the author on one of those, but to admit it, it was really the first author who really had most of the good ideas, and the rest of us were just saying, yes, yes, no, no, that, you know, what about this? Uh, but it looked at things like geographic, temporal, what kind of feedback that is. I mean, you know, sort of what are some of the things that you can look at in putting one of these together and figure out what works and doesn't. So just even taking that approach to just saying, you know, what does the toolkit look like? And what works together and what doesn't? Um, as Stephen points out, we really don't have a lot of the right tools yet. It, it's very hard to study these things where these very qualitative and very quantitative. Uh, a project that I'm starting in September um, we have no idea whether it's going to work or not, but we've tried to come up with a model, sort of a parameterized model of tweeting that has nothing to do with, with the real content, but sort of captures the idea. And then we have a supercomputer where what we can do is we can put different values of these parameters in for different network configuration and generate, you know, sort of millions of, quote, tweets, unquote, which will have put in these different patterns. And then people can look at them and say, okay, um, when we think that what's causing a certain kind of propagation is when this is high and this is high and this is low. Now we can do it. But will this really be realistic to, to Twitter? No, not at all, not at the start. Right? So the question is, can we generate these synthetic data sets, use some of the same tools we're using on real data to figure out whether we, when, when do we see things and when don't we, then start feeding that back to you know, either building better synthetic models or looking at the real data and finding parts of the graph that might have some, some part that corresponds to something. So is this going to work? We have no idea. Um, mostly as we have a big machine and we have a cool idea and we're going to put it together and see what happens. So far, no funding agencies like this idea. So they're like, why do we bother? We know how Twitter works. Right? It's out there. Look at all these people. Look at, you can go to this conference and see a thousand papers about how Twitter works. Yeah, but none of them are able to manipulate the things. So how can you talk about a scientific approach in, uh, in the traditional sense of the Conian uh, scientific method when all you can analyze is so much what's called quasi structure, what's out there, things like that. So it's, it's a very tough space to move into this stuff, even for the simple parts of this, let alone when you want to start studying incentives, governance mechanisms, and things like that. So. It's a really exciting area with a long way to go, but it, it really will take some breakthroughs, not just in understanding, but even in understanding how to understand it. Yeah. What are the right questions there? So these sites are becoming more and more prevalent on the web. People are using that the, the the most successful sites, the Facebooks, Baidu's, etc., uh, are, are are things where people are using it for their own stuff, and, and the company is making money off of it. They're not really so interested in how do you build a better one for solving the problems of the world. They're interested in how do you solve a better one for making our stockholders happy. Uh, meanwhile, over here, you have, you know, imagine a site like I Apply to Prime or something if, if people say, uh, so Ushahidi purposely designed the system 
so it could be reused for many things. They didn't. Uh, um, they did it because they really didn't have a programming staff. They said, we're going to build this in a very simple way because that's all we can do. And by the way, that will make it easier for people to use it again. And it did get used again. And again, I don't know if anyone has really studied, the I don't think anyone has really studied the different uses of it across these different programming decisions. That doesn't make an impact. So the question you asked, you know, can we get natural experiments? Again, long way to go on this, but it's a fascinating thing because again, it's what people are spending huge amounts of their time on. And the question is, can we, you know, you, you want to solve climate change, right? And you're counting on three or four great scientists somewhere to come up with a breakthrough. Maybe you're taking the wrong approach. Maybe it's figuring out how hundreds of millions of people can get together and decide that they can actually do something that's going to correctly affect that thing. Alright, thank you, Mr. Krause. Okay, thanks again, Jim.